Hello and welcome to tonight's Wealth Builders webinar. I'm Karen Conrad Metcalf, Vice President of Wealth Builders, and we are so grateful to have you join us. And uh, we are in, I think, for a real treat. I think I say that every time, guys, because I've got our amazing Wealth Builders coaching team on with us tonight. So I'm just going to have all of you guys give a shout out and say hi to everyone. But in the meantime, those of you that are tuning in, will you please enter in the chat section who you are, who you're tuning in from, so we know who is joining us. So I'm going to just introduce our amazing lineup tonight, starting with Pastor Mike Davis. Hello from Pueblo, Colorado. Glad to be here. All right. And Frank Pulley. Hello from Centennial, Colorado. Thanks for being with us tonight. And Troy Peterson. And hello from Melbourne, Florida. Thank you so much for joining us. <laughs> well, we're so glad. We know this is such a busy time of year and that you have chosen to join us tonight means so much. Okay, this is amazing. I'm just going to try my hardest here to, to get, say hi to everybody. Ed, hello. We saw you earlier on a coaching call. Welcome. So glad to have you. Rena is coming in from Canada. Welcome. Michael and Kareem from Dayton, Ohio. Hello. Mark Rogers from Colorado Springs. Merry Christmas to you too. We've got uh, Brian tuning in from Colorado. Welcome, Brian. Carol and Keith Curtis from Claiborne, Texas. Welcome. We're glad to have you. Hello, Maureen. Another one from our coaching family tuning in from North Carolina. Terry from Arizona. Welcome. We've got Corliss from Florida. Welcome. Lena from Minneapolis. Whoa. Oh my goodness, this is great. Church Three Degrees loves you. I love all of you. I am so glad that you are on. Leanna, thank you so much for joining and tell everybody at Three Degrees Hi for me. We've got Linda from Missouri. We've got Doreen from Uganda. Wow, Doreen, welcome. Carl tuning in from Ohio. Pete and Patty, another coaching family there from Oklahoma, welcome. Nina and David from Delaware, so glad to have you. Michael, all right, from the Canaries, another coaching family, you and Mercedes. Christy from Longmont, Colorado. Welcome, Agnes from Pennsylvania. Don from Colorado Springs. Hello, Joe. Also, I know you're from Colorado, coaching family. Brittany from upstate New York. Sheila from Southern Maryland. We have got, oh my goodness, Anselm, I hope I pronounced that correctly, from India. Welcome. We're so glad to have you. Terry from Wisconsin, the Midwest. Joseph tuning in from Trinidad. Welcome. We've got Gilbert tuning in from Lasaka. Wow. Welcome, Gilbert. James from Pittsburgh. Uh, oh, that's so sweet, Leanna. Thank you. Tell them hi for me. Uh, we've got Deborah tuning in from the UK, another coaching family person, <laughs> Beverly from South Carolina, Mary and Keith from Buffalo Lake, Minnesota. I love all these Minnesotans on here. Just telling you, I miss Minnesota this time of year because there's usually snow, but I hear there is no snow there. At least that's what my dad told me. All right, we've got Lydia from Memphis. We've got Ralph tuning in from the UK. We are so blessed to have you. I really think tonight's going to be a blessing for you. We're going to be focusing on, oh, thank you, Joseph. That, that's super sweet. Um, we're going to be focusing on the end of year financial checklist. Uh, and I just want to remind you that this is all leading up to the Wealth Builders Conference that is happening February 16th through the 18th. And exciting news, Lance Walno, we were at dinner with them a couple weeks ago, and he's like, I want to come and be part of Wealth Builders. So we have added Lance Walno to the lineup, and we are so blessed for that. This is going to be an amazing conference. So if you've not yet registered, please do so. Go to wealthbuilders.org forward slash events. We've got the tickets at a low, low price of just $137, but they are going up January 1st, and we have four VIP tickets left. So if you want to be part of the VIP, meaning you want to have it just a closer connection to each other with networking, to the speakers, some access to hands-on workshops, you want to sign up for the VIP. Again, wealthbuilders.org forward slash events. Okay, so we were talking today as a team and uh, we were actually emailing. We did talk quite a bit today as well. We had coaching calls, 
but we're going to give you an end of year financial checklist that is going to be super helpful, but we're going to start out giving you a bit of insight into what we can expect in 2024 in the real estate market, because there are a lot of different things that are being said. A lot of what I was calling clickbait, just trying to kind of scare people. And we're going to try to clear all that up for you and then go into the financial checklist. So we are going to be taking questions. So I want to encourage you, if you've got a question, type it in the chat or the Q&A. And uh, we've got an amazing Wealth Builders team that is behind the scenes and they're collecting all your questions and they're forwarding that to us. We'll answer as many of those as possible. So make sure that you take advantage of this and then just know that this PowerPoint will be sent out to you because we've got over 40 slides and we're gonna be moving pretty quick. All right, so guys, are you ready to get started? Let's ready. do it. All right, so let's look at the 2024 real estate outlook. All right, guys, this has been a big question for people, the mortgage rates. You know, the question, should we wait to buy because mortgage rates will go down? What is happening? So I'm just gonna give you some information that is out there that I'm gonna have you guys comment on this a bit to get some of your thoughts. So the National Association of Realtors, their chief economist is expecting that the rates will go down into the 6% range by spring of 2024. Um, it seems like everybody has an opinion. We have someone else saying six to six and a half percent. Uh, we have the Mortgage Bankers Association that's looking to reach five and a half percent by the end of 2025. Um, you know, we are hearing everything from it's going to go down to four percent to it's going to stay at seven percent. But it seems like the consensus is we are going to see some drop in mortgage rates this next year. So, Frank, can you just give us your thoughts on that? Yeah, real quickly, I think because we're going into an election year, uh, the powers that be are going to try and keep the uh, rates at kind of a, uh, a, a, you know, a reasonable level. You also got uh, all your uh, lenders and stuff. They're, they're, it's, this is killing them. They have products, but they can't lend money. So, uh, and um, you've also got uh, builders and uh, uh, realtor, you know, they're selling groups of homes and stuff, and they're doing rate buy downs in order to get, uh, you know, to get business. Yeah, so I think we're also seeing some flexibility in products. Um, Troy, I know that you're definitely active working with a lot of the uh, mortgage lenders. What are you seeing? Well, I, I do think there's a lot of clickbait out there with this. Everybody's speculating what's going to happen with rates. It's uh, it's pretty easy to tell what's going to happen tomorrow when you understand what's already happened yesterday. And if you look at the last cycle we had like this, in 2005, 6, 7, we had a huge run up. The feds decided to start raising rates to cause a slowdown. They caused a slowdown, and then they had to lower rates to keep it from go getting any worse. Now, although we don't expect anything near as bad as what happened in 2008, the same cycle could, could go. So we've seen rates come up. They're going to have to come back down. The pendulum always swings back the other direction. It's just a matter of time. But I wouldn't let the rate be what decides your investment or not. It's all about cash flow. You're going to focus on the opportunity and the cash flow, right? Absolutely. I think we're all in agreement with that. And of course, that's what, you know, we teach, Billy teaches, and uh, it kind of helps us to make good decisions no matter what market we're in. All right, you guys. So this is the definitely the clickbait. Will the housing market crash in 2024? Some of the headlines out there is just like economists predict it's the worst ever. Uh, lots of different opinions out there, but this I think is a great article from Forbes and it says, despite uh, some areas seeing price declines, the likelihood of a housing market crash, a rapid drop uh, remains low. I think that's the bottom line. There's a lot of reasons for that, um, but there is still that shortage of supply. And so Mike, I'm just gonna start with you. Do you think we're gonna see a crash in 2024? I don't have a crystal ball, but I do have the Holy Ghost. But uh, so I do not. And uh, it's just because of supply and demand. There is still a shortage of homes from coast to coast, Karen. That's awesome. And Frank, do you want to comment on that, too? I just agree with what Mike says. No supply and a lot of demand. Very good. And uh, let's look at some home prices in 2024. Will home prices go down? 
Uh, really interesting. This is an article from bankrate.com. Housing prices have been on fire lately, culminating in historic highs. It's just talking about September. The median was 394300 and it was only about 20000 short of the highest monthly home price that has ever been recorded, which is in 2022. So it sums it up like this. Will home prices drop in 2024? Probably not, says Yun, who is the economist commenting. Home prices will rise about three to four percent is his prediction. That's just hard to believe in the midst of, you know, what's supposed to be a crisis. Troy, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. Yeah, I've I've been in this for 30 years. I've seen markets go up. I've seen them go down. Are prices going to go down? Yeah, somewhere, but not everywhere. Where it's going to be a you're going to see differences in in the macro market. Look at your local market. We've got the supply and demand issues that have been pointed out, and with supply being so low, no, we're not going to see a tremendous decrease. I do expect a normal run of the mill cycle correction, but not a crash and not a dramatic drop in prices. That's awesome. Let's talk about new construction. Although the National Association of Home Builders expects single family housing starts to increase. 4.6% in 2024 to 946,000 permits after a cumulative decline of 21.2% over the past two years. The recovery is likely to be quite slow in all but the most robust housing markets. That's a really interesting commentary on new construction. You know, if you guys noticed, it, we've just been traveling a lot in the country and we're seeing massive apartment buildings going up. Uh, we were just recently in Colorado and it's like, I just can't even believe it near Castle Rock, Lone Tree, Colorado Springs, there is a ton going on and searching on MLS, I actually have to clear out new construction because it is just filling my MLS. Uh, Frank, can you give us a little insight into new construction? Well, there is a lot of it right now, but again, we got a shortage of houses. So, you know, I think it's gonna balance that out. And as we've said before in some of these past, uh, webinars, um, these builders are really trying to sell their products. They are offering all sorts of incentives, upgrades and carpeting and and uh, bathroom and kitchen refinishing. And of course, rate buy downs. I just drove down uh, the street and saw one at 4.99%, 30 year fixed, by the way. Wow. Yeah. So they're trying to move them with some financing. Yeah. And this is a, a chart that I located in Statista, uh, and this just shows the new construction, single family home construction starts back to 1980. Mike, I know that you've got this chart that goes back further. Can you give people a little insight into what this means in a historical perspective? Well, for the last 75 years, uh, the home prices have appreciated five to six percent in the last 75 years. You can take those great big dips and you can take the great big ups. But when it boils down to the last 75 years, houses have appreciated five to six percent, Karen. Yeah. And this with new construction, part of what we're seeing right now is that this decade has had some of the slowest new construction starts in history which has added to the shortage of homes and has caused like that steady increase in home values oh i i went the wrong direction karen i'm sorry you were talking about the, there's the statistics in the 30s let me just say this real quick i'm yes. sorry the the 30s they built the same amount of homes that they built in the year 2010 to 2000 20. so that's the same decade they built the same number of houses and it went up uh, to, it's supposed to be averaging out to, I believe, 25 uh, million homes, and uh, we're nowhere close to that. We built the same amount that they did in the, the decade of the 30s, and that's why we're talking about supply being so low. It's going to take them a long, long time, so I apologize about that. <laughs> oh, no, that's fine, and that's what you're seeing here from 2010. You're seeing the new construction click up, but look at how much was lost during that time. And so that definitely has had an impact on what we are experiencing in the housing market. And even here it had a dip and now it's coming back up. So, you know, I think there's opportunities in new construction and that's where we can keep our eyes on as well. So now let's talk about the median sales price. This is a chart 
that shows this is very interesting it goes all the way back to like 1950 and it shows just what mike was describing that steady increase now look what happened here in 2022 it was a huge spike a matter of fact if i'm reading this right guys this was the biggest spike in home values median home prices that we have seen um, and we know that it's coming back down, but if you take a perspective on this, and this is that increase Mike was talking about, and you kind of draw that line, really where we're at today is following a very nice trend up. Uh, Troy, any comments on that? Uh, I, I wish that we did have the ability to draw lines on this. I like to draw lines on charts and we did break through the ceiling, the, the, the resistance, but the resistance is now the new support. We will we'll continue to go as dramatic as the increase looks between 2020 and today. Uh, look at the blip on 2005. Remember how dramatic that was? Yeah, it felt and, and really. And that looks like nothing compared to the run up in value we've recently had. That still held firm on the support and did not fall below the threshold. It still stayed within the guide. So I expect that same trend to continue here. Wow, that's a great comment. Um, okay, let's just take a really quick look at existing home sales. And like I said, we're breezing over this really quick because we're going to get to our checklist. But this is very interesting. The existing home sales has definitely trended down. And this chart goes from 2019. It's not a huge perspective. It shows a dip down here in 2020. Uh, then look at all this activity happening here went down and it's it's quite, you know, quite low right now. But again, this is a very short perspective on just a few years. Uh, and then this chart shows us the median price of existing home sales. Uh, and while they have dropped some, they have not dropped significantly. And I think, um, you know, with a housing shortage, with people not putting their house on the market, in many markets, this is probably going to continue to hold strong. And this is a existing home sale median price percent change year over year. Very interesting. It was really slow in the summer uh, in June. But look at what started to happen as soon as we hit July and in the fall. And this to me is the most interesting of these slides. It's showing that the percent change in sales from a year ago by price range is down in everything but luxury homes it's actually up now troy when we were chatting about this you had a perspective on it yeah this is a typical move that you see when people start anticipating the stock market's getting frothy they will pull their money out put it into the luxury properties now they've got a tangible asset that has tax deductibility to it and tends to weather a good a good storm with it better than the stock market. So this is a normal trend to see at this time of the market stage. Wow. So this is stock money where people are getting out of the stock market and they're putting it into something considered safe in luxury homes. That's what you're saying. Yes, that's a that's a trend that, that I've seen before. That's great. Frank, do you think that uh, this is the time to start looking at luxury homes for some people? Well, well, yeah, because I mean, people that buy these luxury homes aren't as impacted mostly by the economy as, uh, you know, as the regular, the regular folks, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I mean, I think they're, they're becoming affordable. Uh, you got to be really careful with your investing in these, but um, and we don't have time to go into the uh, whys and wherefores and how to do it, but yes, it's a good time to do it. All right. That's awesome. Okay. Um, so here is a question that many people have. We, we talk, uh, you know, in our coaching sessions, we talk with each other. Is there an opportunity in real estate in 2024? And Troy, you put together some slides here that's going to take us through uh, what I'm excited to hear about since it is monopoly on opportunity. Yeah, well, this this actually came with kind of a, a, a just a, a quick download I had over the weekend. I hosted my company retreat. And of course, what do you do when you get a whole bunch of real estate people together? You get out the monopoly game and you see who's best. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I won't tell you my wife won, of course, but <laughs> <laughs> as we're playing monopoly, I start to look at this and I realize that, you know, the numbers on monopoly just don't make sense. According to the principles that we teach, we teach you the 1% rule. 
Now, I happen to pick Illinois Avenue here because statistically it is the most landed on monopoly piece on the board. Well, Illinois sells for $240. Don't you wish you could buy a piece of land for $240 today? <laughs> <laughs> but the, the base rent when you buy it is only $20. So that definitely does not meet our 1% rule. A $240 price to a $20 income, that doesn't work. So you don't look at it just on the 1% rule. You have to look at it for the opportunity that's involved. And you notice how in Monopoly, we all know that game, you can increase the income. How do we increase the income? By development or improvement, right? Mm -hmm. So what do we see ahead in 2024 for opportunity? I, I, we've heard a lot of people, a lot of our coaching people are coming in and they're talking about difficulty meeting the 1% rule. So we learn to look at it and say, well, gee, if I'm going to acquire this asset, how can I put a demand on that asset in order to, to, to bring in the income that it needs to bring to make it a viable investment? Well, the answer to that is let's look at what kind of, uh, of development or improvements we can do on it. Is there something we can do to make it a better long-term rental? And if there's not, and long-term rental is your focus, then you find the income opportunity in the right neighborhood in America that offers you that. Is there a way to increase that income through a vacation rental, an executive rental, or a pad split type opportunity? These are all things you can do to help further develop and enhance the income of that property so that it does begin to meet and even exceed your income goals. Uh, so just stay focused on the opportunity and look what you can do with it as you do move forward into 2024. That's really good, Troy. And you know, we have Bill Bronchek, our friend, on a lot, and he's been talking a lot about sub twos. And you know, in a market, no matter what market you in you're in, we really stay with the staples with the numbers. And it just seems like it pulls out the best in people. So here's the bottom line that we can thrive and we do thrive in any market. So part of what Wealth Builders does is gives the, the guidelines of rails to run on, but it's a spiritual biblical foundation that God has us prosper in any time. Uh, and so when we look back on history, it was in some of the most, you know, the world looking at some of the worst times that God actually called forth his people to prosper. We need uh, knowledge, we need understanding, we need wisdom. And uh, that's really what Wealth Builders is all about. So when we look into preparing for 2024, Pastor Mike Davis has a message for you and he's got some things to cover that's gonna really set the foundation for setting your goals and expectations for 2024. Pastor Mike? Well, the great thing is, is that we never have to just go off of what's going on in the economy and the world because we have God inside of us, Karen. And because of that, Jeremiah 29 is very familiar scripture. It says that our future is bright because of him, because of him. And so uh, a lot of times, though, Karen, we're limiting ourselves. We are limiting ourselves, but we need to believe God for our goals. We need to write them down. We need to have scriptures for them, have scriptures for each goal that you have and write it down and don't just write it down in January and uh, not read it again, you know, in the spring, you know, if this is something that's burning on the inside of you, then this scripture needs to be burning off your tongue. It needs to be coming off your lips and believing that things are going to come to you. Billy says that, that money is not pursued, it's attracted. And so the promises of God and the faith of God will cause that to be attracted to you, Karen. That's awesome. Um, so uh, believe in God for your goals, write them down, have scriptures for them. And then what is your limit? In other words, how are you limiting yourself? And, you know, I encourage everybody to read this book, Don't Limit God by Andrew Walmack. You know, that's just a, uh, okay. that'll turn your crank, so to speak. And so, because we all do that, we all limit God, but God wants us to stretch ourselves. There's a, let me just read this real quick in Isaiah 54, verse two through four. This is the message translation. It says this, clear lots of ground for your tents. Make your tents large, spread out, think big, use plenty of rope, drive the tent pegs deep. You're going to need lots of elbow room for your growing family. You're going to take over whole nations. You're going to resettle and abandon cities. 
Don't be afraid. You're not going to be embarrassed. Don't hold back. You're not going to come up short. You'll forget all about the humiliations of your youth and the dignities of being a widow will fade from memory. And so God is just encouraging the children. He's always encouraging children. You know, let's, let's increase. God is the God of increase. Even in the time of recession, even the time of bad economics, God says, I want to show myself strong that the world will know that I am God and I'm being God through the believers. Amen. And then the last one there, Karen, think bigger, dream bigger. God took Abraham out and he says, all right, Abraham, you're not thinking big enough. He says, I want you to look at the stars, Abraham. Abraham, you're not thinking big enough. Look at the sand, all of the sand. He says, can you num name or can you number the stars? Can you number all of this that I'm showing you? And of course not. He says, that's what I'm going to make your descendants. And so God has been doing that since the beginning of time. He wants us to think bigger, Karen. That is so awesome. Uh, do you want to share this quote too? Yeah, this is about Walt Disney and uh, what's going on at Disney World now. He'll be turning over in his grave. But anyway, he said the way to get started is to quit talking and begin doing. That so, is so good. It is. So we need to start stepping out. Don't wait till the interest rates drop down back to 4%. Let's start doing some stuff right here and now. Amen? Yes. Amen. That is so good, Mike. Thank you. And I, I had Mike share that with you before we go into the checklist for a reason. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll just share a little personal story. We were, Dave and I have been believing God for increase and, you know, acquiring more real estate, our businesses thriving and all of that. And I had this aha moment where uh, the Lord was just showing me that he would absolutely love to bring increase. But I had some practical things um, like accounting <laughs> that were not in place. OK, and so we know that God wants to do great things through us, but there is a practical side that you and I need to grab hold of to be good stewards, to be able to manage the blessing that God wants to pour on us. And so in that, a big part of that is our finances, is accounting, which is not my thing. Believe me, I've had to find people that help me with that. Uh, but this is the side, you know, Frank is going to give us, I think it's 12 things that we should look at at the end of year that to me is really going to help us get our net out so that God knows he can bless us with more and we are good stewards of that because he loves us so much. He doesn't want us to increase to the point that we get in trouble, right? Or we're not able to manage it because the word of God tells us that he brings us increase and no sorrow with it. So here is the practical part of your financial checklist. I'm gonna turn it over to Frank Pulley. All right, well, first of all, as Karen said, you gotta do something and so does Walt Disney. Hard work and being organized and focused, that's going to uh, lead to your planning and that's going to lead to your success. So item number one, and just roll them out, Karen. Yeah. Uh, you guys are going to get a uh, a copy of all this, so I'm going to go through it pretty fast. All right. First one on item one. Organize your receipts. Okay, hopefully you don't have this huge box of receipts. Uh, organize them, input them into your uh, software, make sure you register all your income and make sure you have chart of accounts. We'll talk about that uh, another time. Clean up your QuickBooks and your other accounting. Use your bookkeeper to do that. And then upgrade to a software that downloads directly from uh, your bank statements. So you don't have to enter them manually. All you have to do is just go in there and recalibrate uh, them as far as recategorize them, depending on what they are. And Schedule you know, Frank, yeah. if I could just hop in there, yeah. I just want to say, like, as you don't do that, it grows to this big thing. Like, mm -hmm. oh, my gosh, this is going to be impossible. But if you actually I think I'm talking to someone here because you're in my situation. But if you actually like just dig into it, this thing that seems like a giant is is actually not a giant. And so if you're one of those people like I was, that was like, no, I don't want to go there. Just hop in there, get things organized. Your life will be simpler. Yeah, and it's a good point, Karen. I mean, I've got a bookkeeper and I've got an accountant, but I also earmark one hour every Friday to go through 
my QuickBooks and make sure that the receipts and that sort of thing are done. If you do it on a weekly basis, it's really easy to get done. And gosh, Troy, he works with, I have, I have no idea how many different uh, types of uh, businesses, but he gets it done. You want to meet with your accountant, not after the year has begun. Meet with them before because you're going to want to give them your current financial statements, your balance sheet and your P&L. Okay. Yeah, that's good. Um, I will just insert in there too that if you're if you are thinking about switching bookkeepers or switching accountants, download your documents yeah. uh, at the end of year. And then you want to plan together. You know, there may be some things you can do before the year end. Even though there's only about ten days left, there may be things that you can do. I mean, Karen talked about you know giving to wealth builders. There may be some things that you can buy, which I'll talk about in a bit. But look at your next year's goals and plan accordingly. You might ask your accountant, "Hey, can I buy myself some stuff that I need for my business? An iPad, a new laptop." cell phone and some of the other essentials you can write those up as capital expenditures and those uh you know those really help uh, against your taxable income so check with them clean up and organize your office i mean i'm looking at my desk right now and i'm not a good example but uh but but normally my my desk is clean but clean out file drawers get rid of stuff make sure that you get rid of non-essential documents but shred them Determine what you need and what you don't need. And better yet, uh, scan it all and throw it in your computer somewhere and make sure that it's secured. Keep essential documents safe. Make sure you have a clear space to work. And if you're a real estate investor, clean up your property files. You may have stuff, especially if you uh, have done some closings and stuff like that that has people's uh you know social security numbers and things like that on there you want to make sure that those are safe save your essentials for seven years all right and if you've been uh if you've been cheating on your taxes you better save them for a long time <laughs> <laughs> because the irs can't go back make sure you back up your computers now you can use like carbonite or mosey if you want however a lot of us use Dropbox, uh, an external hard drive, um, Google Docs. All of those work well. You don't need all of them. But make sure that you have enough backup space, physical or virtual, in order to be able to do this. Uh, like uh, Google Docs and, uh, um, uh, gosh, uh, Dropbox. I mean, you may need to buy more space. Don't wait till next year to start next year's goals. Do it now. Why wait till January 1st, okay? Make smart goals, okay? Specific, measurable, okay? Attainable, realistic, and time. Adjust them as needed. Look at what worked this year and what didn't work. Let's concentrate on what's working and maybe either refine or get rid of what didn't work. It's a good time to look at pruning, and I know that yes. sounds painful, but it's really not. Uh, and Dave and I have just been talking about this a lot personally, going back and looking at where's the fruit, right? Where's the fruit in our life and where's the opportunities that we are called to step into, but because we're not letting go of some other things that we're used to doing, we may miss that opportunity. So this is a great time to look at that. Absolutely. And I'm, we're doing pretty good. So Mike, Troy, any comments on anything up to right now? Now, I agree with what Karen just said about pruning. It's not fun, but it's absolutely necessary. Yeah. And if you've got limbs that aren't bearing fruit or dead fruit, it might hurt to cut them off, but it's only your pride that it's hurting. It's really setting you up for a blessing for the future. So great, yeah. great addition, Karen. Pastor? Hey, man, that's good stuff. All right, we'll go to the next one then. Schedule an annual meeting, all right? All right, let's roll those out, Karen. Catch up your annual min minutes. We're gonna talk a little bit about our corporate entities. If you've got a, an LLC, you don't need to do a lot, you should. But again, uh, you have to do some stuff to an S corp or a C corp, and I'll talk about that in a minute. But review what is working, what's not working. I say it twice because it's that important. Review your current finances. Your, your P&L, your balance sheet, and your statement of cash flows. 
especially the first two. You're going to need those two in good shape if you plan on borrowing any money. Review and revise your goals. Talk to your accountant. Again, on ex expenses on your annual meeting are deductible. You can go. Uh, and, you know, my wife and I spent time at an Airbnb uh, in Eagle, Colorado for about four days and had our annual meeting. Uh, we can write most of that off because most of that was business related. You can't go to Hawaii for three weeks and write it all off. Okay. <laughs> Get your corporate records in order. Your LLCs, make sure you've got your members, managers for corporate corps and uh, C corps and S corps. Make sure, again, you've got your officers, shareholders, and meeting minutes. You're supposed to write minutes. And minutes are things that if you borrowed money, if you bought a house, if you uh, leased a car, that sort of thing. Periodic reports. In most states, you have to annually report your entity. It's not very expensive, but it gets forgotten all the time. And once again, make sure you remember all of those special circumstances. Better to write them down and then... Fill them out more at your annual meeting than just try and remember at the end of the year. So, uh, Frank, is that just something where if people have had special circumstances or significant things, are you saying just that they should document it and then file it um, with their annual meeting notes? Or Well, they, you certainly can run copies of that and do that. But you could, in your meeting minutes, would say, hey, you know, we had a meeting uh, and we determined that we were going to buy this property for this particular reason. We spent this amount of money and here were related expenses. It, it, it's actually pretty simple, um, but you got to at least write it down. Awesome. Okay. Great time to buy properties. Mm -hmm. Okay. Banks like to get rid of them by the end of the year. Although once in a while you can make an offer on a property in December and you can close uh, in January, but it's a busy month. Great opportunities on the MLS. Uh, if people are people that list these things are pretty motivated for the most part. But again, you're going to have to shoot for closing by the end of the year. And if you can't, then figure out a way that maybe you can still get that property. Yeah, we're just personally, I know Troy just went under contract on something too, but we had a property that we um, put a bid in on. We thought we had a deal. Someone came in, they said, no, we're going to give you a full price. And Levi said, you know what? I just have a feeling that that's going to come back around. And sure enough, it did. And now because it's this time of year, if you're in a situation looking at a property, wow, I would take a run at that at a great price because the last thing it seems like people want to do is have to go into the new year and think about having to sell their property if it's been on the market for a while. Yeah. So we've gotten our best deals this time of year, time after time, and I know you guys have as well. Oh yeah. Improve your time management skills. We could spend a whole section on this, yeah. but throw away your paper calendars and use an electronic one. There's Outlook, there's Google. I like Google, but it's not the only one. Schedule all your important dates and appointments, your personal, your business, birthdays, anniversaries, holidays, time to do your periodic reports, your license, put it all on one. And uh, or you can run two different ones. You can run a personal and business, but make sure you don't step on appointments. Make a daily, weekly to do list. And review at the end of the day. And if you look at this time matrix real quick, you can you can just Google time management matrix or priority matrix. It's going to show you where you can kind of put these tasks at the right point in time and uh, put them on your to do list. That's great. Hey, I just want to ask uh, you guys, the coaches here. You know, one of the things that we need to do is to create a corporate calendar because there's multiple businesses. There's what do you guys use? Like, I know you said you use Google, but when you've got multiple entities, do you guys have a favorite tool that you use for a corporate calendar? I, I still use Google because you can actually uh, have several calendars and you can either share those back and forth or, you know, or, uh, you can look at one, but then you can kind of look at all of them together. Troy, what do you do? I'm using a Microsoft Exchange platform right now, and I like that because I can take all my calendar events and combine it on one calendar, and it syncs across all my devices for easy access. Yeah. 
That's awesome. Mike, what do you use? I use Apple. I'm the, the, the funny guy looking out here. And the reason we, we like Apple is it's kind of like what Troy did. There's several different calendars and uh, they're all shareable with my wife so she can keep tabs on everything. And so, but it's all incorporated into one space, into one calendar. And That's there's great. A little, yeah, there's a little pain starting to use one of these, but I'm telling you, once you get used to it, you'll never go back to just some old paper calendar. Because if yeah. you forget your calendar at work, you have no idea what's happening the next day. If you forget it at home, you have no idea what's happening that day or, or beyond that. And ask me how I know this. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, ask me how I am asking these questions because I've been double and triple booked, which you guys know. Yeah. Yeah. So we're really working on this. You know, these are things yeah. that to scale up, you know what? We gotta we gotta deal with these things. I really appreciate it. Okay, Frank. You're never gonna know it all. Just like the scripture, right? Pastor Mike, there's I mean, you could study it forever and not know it all. Same Amen. with real estate. So you have some you have some resources. Wealth Builder University. Legalwiz.com, if you're one of our coaching students, you get access to Bill Bronchick's site that has over 18 different courses in business and real estate. You get access for life. Local business gatherings are a good way to go. Retail or real estate associations or meetups. Um, title companies offer different types of courses at low prices. Um, Real estate uh, companies that work with investors, they offer education too. So no reason not to keep up on your education. You know, when you're a real estate agent or a insurance agent, you know, we're required to take continuing oh. education to keep things up. But um, when we're not in those, it's really kind of a discipline or a making space for it. Uh, but this could be one of those good goals. Like if you end up... If, like for me, I end up so busy. It's like the, I'm not leaving space for, I need to read. I need to learn. Certainly, yeah. you know, there's other, we learn all the time through conversations, but I really appreciate you bringing this up because there's a lot of changes in the market. There's changes legally happening. There's legislative changes. And so when we can keep in tune with those, it keeps us sharp. Plus it keeps us creative, you know, thinking yeah. outside of the box. So this is so good, Frank. Thank you. And finally, this will go in line with what we all believe. Increase the spiritual and personal growth aspect of your business. Hey, learning about real estate or your business is great, but you've got to personally grow and you got to spiritually grow. So here are some things you can do. Remember to create some reflection, scripture, prayer time every day. Organize volunteer giving back programs. That's just the Christian thing to do. Support and observe work-life balance for the people that work for you and for yourself. Align your business with ethical standards and practices and encourage and practice daily gratitude. Wow, that is so good, Frank. Um, Mike, I'd love to hear some of your comments on this. Well, I think it's all awesome. And just as far as uh, wealth builders goes, we all know it's a 501c3. It's a tax exempt. And so I'll pull uh, on this little tab for a second because, you know, I believe Billy and Beckett's on their heart, not just to reach the state of Colorado, not just to reach the, the continent uh, of the United States and North America, but their goal is to go around the world with the gospel, with the good news to help people to make sense of making money, to make a difference, Karen. And so it's been a big impact, what you've been involved in in South Africa that reaches all the way up to the northern part of Af Africa. And so uh, this is a great time for people that are just tender in their heart. You know, a lot of times people say, you know, well, I just want to be led. But you know what I've come to find out, Karen? You know, God says, where do you want to give, Mike? Just give and I'll make sure that you have the ability to give. It says that Second Corinthians yeah. that he gives seed to the sore. So if you want to sow, this is a great place to sow. Amen. Oh, Amen. that's so sweet. Thank you so much, Mike. Um, you know, Troy, when we were emailing a little bit earlier today, and I was asking you guys, you know, what are some things we want to share for end of year? You were talking about discouragement. And I think there is, I think a lot of people 
deal with discouragement. And so I just wanted to give you an opportunity to maybe um, share with people on that, encourage them, you guys, you chime in too. And then we've got some questions that we will answer to finish up. But I think this is an important topic. Yeah, that's it is something we do see quite a bit, Karen. We do see people, especially we get into our coaching and somebody goes out and they start looking for a property and they don't find a property that meets the rules where they can get cash flow and they tend to get discouraged. And we we live in this world where society programs us to accept mediocrity and to make excuses and to accept defeat. So we often will, will hear... I tried and it didn't work, so I just quit. Well, that's really just discouraged. Proverbs says that, you know, a righteous man will try seven times, but he gets back up eight. We don't fail. God wants us to keep going. It's the process of gaining wisdom. As right. Billy says, wisdom comes through experience. So uh, we don't want to get discouraged when we're out there looking for things, because often what will discourage the masses creates an opportunity for you and for me. Mm -hmm. So if we run across an obstacle that appears to be discouraging and everybody around us is discouraged by it, the first thing you want to look at is say, well, gee, if they're discouraged by it, are they the person I want to take advice from? Uh, another way to say it is, are you taking financial advice from a broke person? Because <laughs> if you are, then you're going to be discouraged. But if you hear them speaking a discouraging word to you, uh, like one of my favorites, if you're starting in real estate, my own dad told me this years ago, he said, son, you've got three kids in diapers. You can't quit your job and go do real estate. You need an income and you're not going to make it. Uh, you can imagine the joy I felt several years later when I had to give my dad $30,000 so he could buy a house. Yeah. So you're going to hear that discouragement. But when you hear that discouragement, Ask them, what's your bank balance? If they are qualified to give you advice, they should have a good bank balance. If they're not, then accept the fact that they're not your competition and you go look for the opportunity that they've ignored. There's going to be so much opportunity to head for us. Mm -hmm. The greatest transference of wealth happens in Down's times. Uh, a, a great book that I would highly recommend you read is by a guy named L.G. Letourneau. He, it's called Movers of Men and Mountains. And here's a guy who was born in the late 1800s who started a thriving business during the Great Depression. And he talks flippantly about building like a, he, he, his whole claim to fame was earth movers. And Caterpillar was one of his biggest customers that bought all his products. And he decided he wanted to build a, an offshore drilling rig because he thought he could do it better than anybody else. So he went and presented it to somebody and they said, well, sure, it's only going to cost a couple million dollars. And he just flippantly writes, I happen to have a couple million dollars, so I built it. So he saw the opportunity in somebody else's discouragement and jumped in and proved that it could work and profited from it. So I just want to encourage you to really look for the opportunity in this coming season because there's going to be plenty of it. One final thing I'll say, and then I'll shut up. The greatest point of opportunity shown is written in the book of Exodus when Israel left Egypt. Think about the great and terrible day of the Lord. They were both the same day. It was a terrible day for those who were focused on all the bad news that just happened from the plagues. It was a great day for the nation of Israel that saw the opportunity ahead. And which one, and if you don't know the answer to this, I'm not going to give it to you. I'm going to challenge you to go read the story. Which one left with all the gold? And I'll leave it at that, Karen. <laughs> That's really good. Yeah. And, you know, from a um, just looking at the times that we live in, Billy talks a lot about the times of Issachar, knowing the time, the seasons, and knowing what to do. And this is that time that he start, first started talking about 18 to 20 months ago. And he said, when you see these things, this is the time that you are going to have the opportunity to buy. And we are right on that time. Uh, so it is definitely, I know there's a lot going on, a lot of challenges. If we focus on discouraging things, it's very easy to get discouraged, but we're gonna challenge each other. And that's part of being part of this family where we challenge each other to look at the opportunity and the good things. And you guys have done an amazing job explaining that tonight and sharing. So we've got some questions that we are going to jump into here. Um, 
A lot of really interest in the accounting part. Candace says she said it would be awesome to have a podcast on the accounting aspect. And I think that's a great suggestion, Candace. Uh, and we'll definitely look into that and see if we can't get some good education out there on accounting. Um, Lydia, welcome. I'm so glad you're on, says this. She says, this is our first year with an LLC. We started a midterm rental in a different state. Any recommendations on how to find a solid accountant? Mike, you are our team guy, so I'm going to start with you. Well, I think a great thing is if you go to the, uh, uh, I just went blank, the, the, the city that has, in your city, you have a real estate, um, what's the word? RIA. Yeah, RIA, where uh, that is a great place to find uh, a great accountant because, you know, most of those guys, all investors that I've come across, they want to help out. And so you can just start talking to them and saying, hey, do you have a great accountant? And if you have a great realtor, a great property manager, ask them uh, about their accountant. And so, and then you need to interview them once you do find them, Karen. Yeah, that's really good. Frank, anything to add to that? Well, just make sure that they know real estate. Make yeah. sure that they know things like uh, creative financing and anything a little outside of the box because not every accountant does. Yeah, and what um, we're moving back to Colorado, a lot of you know that. And so I reached out to, um, I reached out to a lady that used to do the bookkeeping for one of the guys that did, I know a ton of flips that I worked with and she doesn't do it anymore, but I asked her, who would you recommend for an accountant? So if you know someone that's in the similar business and ask them for a recommendation, you know, not only are they going to kind of be there to advocate for you a bit, but also they're uh, doing the same thing you are. And so they're gonna help you to locate someone. All right, Lydia also asked, and Troy, I'm gonna have you explain this. What is the 1% rule? She said, this is a new term to her. That's a great question, Lydia. And it uh, it really is, it's, it's a guideline more than it is a rule. And think about it as a quick litmus test that we use to determine if a property we're wanting to look at needs a deeper dive. And really what it says is your monthly rent should be 1% of the purchase price. So to make it real simple, a uh, $100,000 house should rent for $1,000 a month. That's your general 1% rule guideline. Great question. Yeah, thank you, Troy. It's a great answer. So Jenny asked this, what is a pad split? I don't know what that is. So does one of you guys know? <laughs> Pad split is kind of a new hybrid of uh, it's it's a form of house hack. Uh, pad split is actually also a company. I've met with the owners of this company. They do this across the country. They will do a master lease on your property, and then you can start renting out each individual rooms. You could take a four bedroom house that might rent for two thousand a month and turn it into a four thousand dollar a month income with minimal effort. Uh, so it's just another version of house hack and it's a great way to alternatively increase the incomes on your property. Awesome. Uh, Gilbert has a great, great question. And Mike, I'm gonna go to you on this because we actually have a whole teaching on this. He says, I'm building my real estate and I wanted to find out if there are variations to the 1% rule or other rules that he can employ. We actually have a whole coaching se uh, session called alternative rent ratio. So Mike, can you explain that? Yes, if you put down 20 to 30%, of course, a lot of people even say, well, I wanna pay cash. You still need to follow these guidelines. And so if you put down 20 to 30% would be the max. If you figure out your PITI, your principal interest taxes and insurance, and when you make that payment and then you find out the rent, Billy says the most important question is not how much it costs, but what would that property rent for? And so if you figure out how much it rents for and then figure out your PITI with 30% down as the maximum, it should cash flow $300 for an individual door, uh, 200 for a duplex, at least 100 to 150 for a fourplex. So that would be an alternative instead of the 1%. We want you to cash flow. And I'll say one other thing just real quick too. The newer the property, 
you can go into a little bit tighter uh, uh, as far as the cash flow because you're not going to have to do anything as far as new roof and all of that. I had a friend who had a brand new house and he was cash flowing $150 to $250. I said, I think that's okay because you're not going to have any maintenance for that for at least five to 10 years. Yeah. And with that, you don't want to uh, go just on cash flow. There's some other things that we kind of put around that to support you too. One of them is to stay within two to four times the median income in yes. the area. So if the median income in the area is $50,000, uh, another safety factor in addition to that $300 is to keep your price in that situation at $200,000. And the reason for that is then you're not over buying in the market. Another thing that we want you to look at is a 10 to 20% cash on cash return. So we've got the $300 net cash flow. We've got the two to four times median income and 10 to 20% cash on cash return. Frank, can you explain that term? That's a really important one for people. Well, basically it's just your return on your investment and, and it's a gauge of how fast you're going to get your, the money that you put in your all in money down payment, some fix up, how quickly you're going to get it back. And the higher the number, the better. So 10 to 20% we're looking at as a minimum. If you can get more than that, that's great. And that's cash you put in, which would include your down payment. Yep. Um, if you have to put cash in to put a fence in or do improvements because you want a good, there's always a risk involved with real estate, even though we know historically it is really the best. That's how people have made money year after year. And we show you that, but you still want to compare it to investing in other types of investments. So for that, if you have to put a lot of money into it, your down payment, you want to put a demand on that return in that range of 10 to 20% in addition to $300, in addition to 2 to 4% within the median income. So I know that's a lot of information, but it's important that, that you have all those. And it's in Billy's book, Strategic Real Estate Investing. We talk about it a lot at the Real Estate Workshop. I'm sure we'll talk about the Wealth Builders Conference as well. Uh, Troy, can you, someone wants to know, can you repeat the name of the book that you mentioned? Absolutely. It is by L.G. Letourneau. And it is called Movers of Men and Mountains, or I'm sorry, R.G. Letourneau. Awesome. Thank you so much. All right. So Brittany has got another team question here. Uh, and she says, how do we find a team? We did talk briefly about an accounting, but then she, she's talking about an attorney, um, you know, probably a real estate agent. How do we find people that are Christian based? And so who would like to take that one? I'll jump on that one. So it's nice to have somebody that you work with that is of like faith, but Jesus also told us to make friends with unrighteous mammon. So for me, I don't get hung up on what somebody's faith is. I look for honesty. I look for integrity. I look for wisdom and I look for experience. And if they've got those things, the faith can spill over. Uh, I also think of a story from Bill Bronchek who worked with Billy for years. And I remember being at a Wealth Builders conference with him a few years ago when his hand went up and to hear Bill tell the story, he looked up and there's his hand up when somebody called and said, do you wanna be filled with the spirit? And, and he told me, he asked Billy, hey, Billy, I've worked with you for years. How come you never said anything? And Billy says, if you get close enough to the pond, you're likely to slip and fall in. So, <laughs> <laughs> I tend to think that I'm not worried about where their faith is. I'm worried about will they benefit? And then I'm going to let my faith shine to them in the process and let God deal with the rest. And yeah, I love that. Stay with the honesty, the integrity, the character. Those are things that you're always going to be looking for. And I, I think that's a great answer. Thank you so much. Okay, so um, Gilbert says, thanks for this powerful insight. He really believes real estate will transform his business. Do you have resources for school owners? He's built a school in 2018 and due to COVID, he could not open it. And now he is hard pressed trying to open in January. And Gilbert, I think from what I'm reading here that you are um, maybe in Africa is what I'm thinking in Zambia. Um, but anyway, I think it's a great question. So someone that maybe has a commercial building, they weren't able to put it to work the way that they initially thought, what can people do? 
Frank, do you want to take that? Well, I mean, if they've got a commercial, here's here would be a real win. You got somebody that's got part of a commercial building and it's vacant. And and they're operating part of it, but they still need another tenant. And you might be able to get yourself a, a really good deal initially on a uh, on that part of the building. That's really good. And also, um, Gilbert was asking about just more information on real estate in Africa. And we are actually launching a master class in Africa soon. Um, so you'll hear more about that. We've got a lot of exciting updates with Africa coming. And we definitely, uh, matter of fact, my Uber driver last night is a buying real estate in Nigeria. It was such an interesting discussion, but we really believe Africa does have that opportunity and you will hear more from us on that in the coming weeks and months. And then finally, real quick question, Sharon is wondering if there's another accounting software that you guys use other than QuickBooks. I've been asking that same question. We've been using QuickBooks for years. I, I, I'm not a fan of the QuickBooks model, especially since I now have to have an online account for every individual company that we operate. And that to me is just too many accounts to log into. So we do look for alternatives, but there are all kinds of alternatives out there. There's Peachtree software. There's, there's different softwares that you can use out there. But what I would highly recommend you do is get with your accountant and find something that he or she is can that knows and can collaborate with you on and work with it. And then, as my accountant told me, suck it up and pay the fee, Troy. It's worth it. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Any? Do you guys use any? I've I've worked with Peachtree at a bank, but we definitely use QuickBooks. All right, great. And then Maureen says, thank you. She really needed to hear this information right now. Inspirational to get done before the new year. And she says, Merry Christmas. So I want to thank you uh, guys for being on here and just taking your time to impart into us with this. And I want to thank all of you, our Wealth Builders family, for tuning in. Um, I just I spent some time with Billy and Becky the past few days. They pray for you every day. And so I want you to know when you are part of this family, you are really part of a family. Um, we love and appreciate you. We are so looking forward to seeing as many of you as possible in February. If you can't join in person, please join online. And I'll just go back and leave you with this scripture. Uh, and this is from Jeremiah 29, 11, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. And that is our prayer to all of you. Merry Christmas, Happy New Year, God bless you, and have an amazing rest of the night. Merry Christmas, everybody. Merry Christmas, good night. <laughs>